resistant superbugs. How microbiology can avert a post-antibiotic world. <coughs> Timothy Walsh, Cardiff University. On November the 9th, 1989, I was in Tasmania, Australia. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, fellow speakers, uh, minister, distinguished guests, my name is Timothy Walsh and I am a professor of microbiology uh, at, in the United Kingdom. I also uh, run the Gates program called Barnard's, looking at antibiotic resistance in Africa and South Asia. Uh, we also run the Chinese uh, surveillance program and also the one in, in Vietnam. So my talk today, and I have now 14 and a half minutes, is to try and impress upon you the seriousness of this. I was very interested in Gus's talk because in the United Kingdom, we have put antibiotic resistance on the same level as global warming and international terrorism. That is how seriously the United Kingdom are taking it. So what has gone wrong and why are we going back to the pre-antibiotic era? Well, there are two issues really and they're listed here for you. The first one, is that the bacteria are kind of falling apart and they're becoming less fussy about the DNA that they have in them. And so the genome, the bacterial genome is increasing and they're like sponges and can just absorb lots of DNA, lots of antibiotic resistant genes. The second, as you might imagine, as in all these sorts of talks, is the stupidity of mankind, which has been, quite frankly, spectacular and uh, we are all to blame. And so we have basically not acted globally. Um, certainly we've not kept our eye on those countries most affected and how we can help them. Also, we've kind of been very myopic and very US-centric, very EU-centric in the way in which we go about our work. And so therefore, we've kind of not really looked at the broader issues, and the broader issues are things like poverty, things like sanitation, and indeed corruption, which are all linked to AMR. So this slide is a busy slide, but on the right-hand side, you will see that we have low middle-income countries, and we have factors there in their societies, such as sanitation, such as poor use of antibiotics, such as corruption that impacts on health systems, that all actually increases antibiotic resistance. And so it is kind of a demographic, it is about anthropology as much as it is about the bacteria kind of responding to the exposure of antibiotics. So we have kind of, in our hospitals and, and clinicians, we often think about the box at the right, top right-hand corner. And so we're kind of, again, myopic in the way in which we look at the patient and deal with the patient and treat the patient. But actually, in the communities and in societies, there are many things going on with the use of antibiotics in farming, such as in China and India and America, etc., and in Europe, we are also not blameless in this, and how that actually impacts on antibiotic resistance, how it affects sewage, what we do with our sewage as a human species. In, in 2020, China will have to deal with 20 billion tons of sewage. How's that going to happen as a population if we grow by 2.5? billion by 2050, what are we going to do about that? And so all these factors actually impact on the bacteria that actually will eventually infect us. The other problem that we have is that we have not really designed novel, and I mean novel or unique, antibiotic structures. Nearly all the antibiotics that we have going in phase one or phase two, phase three clinical trials are all variations of drugs that have been before. And that basically means the bugs recognize them and can respond to them quite quickly. So in fact, I often think that the antibody discovery pipeline is a bit like sports cars. The best ones were in the 50s and the 60s, and now, you know, <laughs> we've kind of lost our imagination as to how to uh, produce new, um, new antibiotics. And you've probably heard some of these definitions, multi-drug resistance, extensively drug resistance, and of course, pan-drug res resistance means basically we don't have any uh, antibiotics left to treat the patients. And so these are definitions that we use, and I'm just going to give you 
two examples going from one to another. The first one is this one here, and it's called NDM1. And this was a paper that we published about six years ago, and it created a big stink around the world, largely because we named the gene after the capital of India. Not a good idea. Uh, and also, we refer to something called medical tourism, and I'll come back to that later on in my talk. But effectively, this kind of left me banned from India for about a year, uh, and there were kind of other issues um, going on as well. But nonetheless, it, it kind of made the impact that we would hope it did to try and make this issue a global concern. So where is NDM1 now? So this is kind of the countries, the map of where NDM1 has spread all over the world, and it's almost done it in real time, you can see that India and Pakistan are still the epicenter, but almost in real time, it's spread very quickly around the world. The other example I'm going to give you is something called MCR1, which is a very recent discovery in the last year and a half. And this is the paper that we published with our Chinese colleagues. And this actually um, invoked the ban in China of colistin being used as a growth promoter in China. So the Chinese government were actually fantastic in the way in which they res uh, responded to this. So those are two examples, and, and MCR1 basically gives you resistance to clistin, and that is the last antibiotic we use in human medicine. So once that goes, it's game over. We are at pan-drug resistance. This is where MDR1 um, is, sorry, MCR1 is now. The reason why India is in dark colored is because we can't get any data out of India, but it was a Swiss study that sent their students to India. They swabbed them, they rectal swabbed them before they went. When they came back, you can only do that with students, and they found about 20% of the students had MCR1. So if you extract the figures to that and extrapolate that data, something like about 200 million people in India alone are carrying MCR1 as normal flora. This was a study that was um, um, commissioned by the UK government, and it effectively looked at where we're going to be in 2050 uh, as a global community. And this study was really interesting because it was a forecast study, of course, but it also tried to put some economics into this. People don't really care if other people die. That sounds blunt and brutal, but it's actually true. But if you say to somebody that, actually, I'm going to take away half your bank account or half your living, that will actually have a huge impact on them. So unfortunately, money speaks, and so there was an economic issue to this as well. Basically, where we are in the world, something like one person every 10 minutes dies of a common infection, more or less, from the figures that we know. It's predicted by 2050, one person every three seconds will die of a common infection. That is not TB, that's not HIV, that's not Ebola. This is your bulk standard E. coli, which is in everybody's gut as you sit here before me in this auditorium. How, what is sort of the, the global burden of this, if you like? Here we have AMR in the top right-hand corner. 10 million people will actually die compared with all these other diseases. And so they actually now will dwarf, antimicrobial resistance will dwarf all the other diseases like cancer, et cetera, diabetes, cholera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a huge issue. How much will it cost? Well, very difficult to say. But the forecast is looking at the de uh, uh, debilitation, really, of, of people and the burden it will put in on our hospitals, it will cost about 100 trillion US dollars. So what does that mean? That is five times the wealth of Europe over a five-year period. So those in the room who are concerned about Brexit, this makes Brexit look like a drop in the uh, Pacific Ocean. OK? <laughs> Don't worry about Brexit. Worry about this. There are conflicting factors that we really don't think about too much. And some of them are things like internet sales. So normally, we would go to our GP and we'd say, look, I'm sick, and I need a prescription. And he'd say, OK, fine, you can have this antibiotic. This is a very high-end antibiotic called meropenem. No answers, uh, no, sorry, no questions asked, um, and you get overnight delivery, cash on delivery. And this is in a country like Canada that's very, very clean. Things like medical tourism, well, what is that? It's when you go to a country to have an operation. How big is it? It's huge. It's about 10 million people every year go to these countries for elected operations. In 2015 alone, 3.2 million people went to India for elected operations. It's actually the fastest growing medical industry in the world. 
And obviously with that comes the issue of post-surgical care, etc. Things like when global, we talk about global warming, things about flooding, where we actually have contamination of potable water um, through, um, um, through a flooding of sewage, etc. So, you know, this is a real issue. So now I'm going to um, do a little exercise with you, and hopefully we can have the lights on, and in the viewing room, you should also have some cards in your pocket. Now, these cards are down by your side. And on one side, you have something called ESBL. And on another side, you have MCR1. So I want you to just look at the ESBL side of the card and hold it up so everybody can see it. The ESBL, I want you to show the ESBL side of the card, not the other one if you can. Now, if you look around the room, you'll see that there's far more red dots than green dots. And red dots means you're positive. You're not going to die, it's OK. Red dots means you're positive. In other words, you're carrying ESBL as normal flora. 90% of the people in the room have red dots. This is the situation uh, in South Asia, where over 1 billion people are contaminated with this type of antibiotic resistance. Now turn the card over for MCR. And this is a resistance that may have started in China or India, but we know that four, at least four to 500 million people in China and India alone carry MCR1 as their normal flora. That is over the population of the United States. And remember that this is the resistance that gives you um, resistance to the last uh, choice antibiotic, colistin. And it's game over. So that's nearly half a billion people in China and India alone from our studies. So that gives you some idea of what we're facing. We did this study um, fairly recently, and it was published with our Chinese colleagues. It was published in Nature. And what we wanted to try and do was to try and make the links between the farm, the farmer, the, the community, and then look at things like insects as well as companion animals like dogs. And we showed, in fact, this, that when we actually measure resistance, Classically, we measure whether the bug go, grows on the drug. What we don't do is to look at the whole background DNA, which we call the resistome. And we call this the phantom resistome. And when we did this, you can see that actually the phantom resistome, in other words, the green bars are much higher than the purple bars. So when we look at resistance, it's actually much higher than it, what we actually would classically see using classical um, experiments or classical methods. And so therefore, we're actually only just reaching the tip of the iceberg when we actually measure resistance in around, well, in around the world, per se. And this just gives you this illustration of where we've managed to kind of join up the dots between the farmer, the flies, migratory birds, and we've tracked the same E. coli going distances of about 70 kilometers by migratory birds. OK, so when we think about antibiotic resistance, it's just not the ward, the hospital, etc but a much bigger picture. The other problem is the use of antibiotics in animal feeds. I took these photographs three um, weeks ago, and you can see that the, the ingredients there is colistin, again, which we use in human medicine to treat last resort uh, infections. And so there has to be a joining up of the dots with this. And I'm pleased to say, again, China has taken the lead. So this particular slide here shows the countries in green, like China and and Thailand had a banned colistin, but there is still a lot to do with the other countries in Southeast Asia. So what are we doing about it? Well, the UN Assembly met over 190 countries and signed a declaration, and that was good to have some sort of political commitment, but there is an awful long way to go. We are trying to tackle XDR, extensively drug resistance, and these are the societies that are involved in this. I'm also a member of the Fleming Fund, so we're trying to come up together and have a coordinated approach is it too little, too late? I suspect it is, but there's, we still have to try. So this is my final slide. And at the top, we have a German scientist called Paul Ehrlich. And he basically came up with this idea of an antibiotic. And the bottom figure there shows the tsunami. And whether resistance starts in China or Pakistan or in India, it doesn't matter. You know, we are a small global community, and it will come to us. And this is a quote that I, well, a quote of me, actually, 
uh, of something that I wrote about global warming as well. Fleming's warming has fallen on deaf ears, <coughs> deafened by the sound of falling money. It seems inevitable that future generations will not only be moaning erratic weather patterns, we will leave them due to global warming, but they also lament that for those who knew better, we created superbugs with little regard to the long-term consequences. And there is coming a time when the magic bullets are no longer magic or bullets. Thank you very much for your attention.